a very yeah. standard astronomer, somewhat strange astronomer. In fact, Philip James Peebles is a theoretical cosmologist. And this is his universe, his Princeton University office, where he makes painstaking calculations to explain the birth and evolution of the universe. When I got into this subject, I was quite uneasy about it because it seemed so speculative. Back in 1964, Peebles and his teacher, Robert Dickey, showed that a universe which began with a Big Bang should be filled with heat radiation, which would be detectable at microwave frequencies. This is an invention from, by my teacher, Bob Dickey. The device that was used to discover this thermal radiation from the early universe. One year later, Dickey and Peebles found what they sought, but they were one month behind two physicists from the Bell Laboratories, for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize. I think the feeling that the Princeton group was not the first to discover it was one of slight disappointment. But I think much more strong was the feeling there is actually something there to measure. And of course, if you can measure, you can learn and discover about the nature of our universe, a wonderful new window. It was the excitement more than anything. Peebles likens the microwave background radiation left by the Big Bang to ripples in a pond. If we had had a larger container, the wavelength would be different. So by studying the nature of these ripples in the water, one may deduce the presence of this boundary even if I didn't, couldn't see it. Likewise, studying the background radiation has led to estimates of the age, composition and geometry of the universe. Even to figure out the first moment of the creation of the universe. Today, we know that about 13.7 billion years ago, the universe evolved from a hot, dense plasma to the highly structured cosmos we see today. But new discoveries have sparked new queries. Cosmologists probing the total content of the universe know that the visible stuff, such as galaxies, actually take up about 5%. Another quarter is cold, dark matter. The remaining 70% is something which acts to push the universe apart. It's known as dark energy, which Peebles is still studying. The dark energy, it is purely hypothetical, invented not by magic, I would say, but by imagination to fit the observations. Back on Earth, Peebles enjoys strolling around the Princeton campus. So I get inspiration from nature, but more directly, it's relaxation, it's fascination, it's another aspect of the physical world. Another relaxing pastime is light carpentry. Scientific research is unlike crafting a chair where the actual result is quickly seen. Peebles' theories are still hotly debated in the world of cosmology. I will make proposals that turn out to be quite wrong. So I have a wonderful record of failures. Failures in the sense that a better way was found. Recent observations have reaped new discoveries. It was previously thought that after the Big Bang, the expansion of the universe would decelerate. But it's now found that the expansion is accelerating. This proves that another form of energy prevails, and as Peebles proposed, one that can be a repulsive force. <laughs> but while Peebles ponders the profound, to his wife, he's just an ordinary guy. Do what he calls watching the big game on television, which means he sits down in front of the television, mm -hmm. turns on the football game, the basketball game, or the hockey game, and goes to sleep. <laughs> but if I switch the channel, he wakes up. <laughs> Wait, I'm watching the big game. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not the Lord of the Universe, nor are any scientists. We 
are toiling humbly, I hope, to try to understand a bit of the reality that's around us, but in very thin slices. We are so proud that we do know things, some things. We should be proud, but we should not forget that we have many discoveries still to be made. Biotechnology is a fast developing industry. Along this one street in San Francisco alone are about a dozen such companies, including the world's first biotechnology firm. This firm was co-founded by entrepreneur Robert Swanson and scientist Herbert Boyer. Their statues still adorn the front of the building. They set up this company 30 years ago based on an important discovery by Boyer and another scientist. Boyer was an obscure scientist until this discovery that DNA cloning technology can be used to mass produce medicine. It made him famous and rich. It changed my life because um, after these discoveries in the early 70s, we did get quite a lot of uh, attention from television, magazines, and newspapers, and so on and so forth. Boyer, aged 69, now lives in this mansion in San Diego. He was a biology professor at the University of California, San Francisco, retiring more than 10 years ago. He says the scenic view reminds him of his days back in the laboratory. For me, science is a young man's engagement. It takes a lot of energy, and I used to work um, 14 hours a day, sometimes more, Saturday, Sunday. Um, it, it was almost an obsession. Cohen and Boyer met in 1972 when they both attended a scientific conference in Hawaii. There, the academics explained their research projects. Boyer was studying the state of DNA after being cut by certain enzymes. He found the open ends from the cuts can link up with other similar genetic fragments. Cohen was specializing in research into plasmids, the DNA in bacteria that's shaped like a small ring and has the ability to self-replicate. Well, I suggested to Herb that we collaborate and I told him what I had in mind. And he said, well, you know, he was thinking of similar types of experiments. So uh, it was a perfect match. He didn't have the enzymes to do it. And I didn't have his little plasmid. Uh, and um, so we had, it was a perfect marriage. Cohen and Boyer linked the DNA of a frog with a plasmid and put it back inside bacteria. They found when bacterial cells multiplied, the new DNA also self-replicated. This breakthrough is called cloning. It enabled the mass production of medicines such as insulin and growth hormones. The other application is to be able to think about gene therapy. The same thing by taking a piece of DNA from one organism and put it to another animal so that we have the so-called biotechnology, genetic engineering, uh, so we can uh, improve the quality of uh, crops, improve the quality of stocks and, and all that. It's all uh, as a result of uh, this uh, ability to manipulate the clone DNA. Genetic engineering benefits mankind with innovations in healing diseases and making drugs, but it also raised the controversial possibility of cloning animals or even humans. Scientists in this research field have been killed or maimed. Boyer has received threatening letters. Well, they, they would just say that you better be careful when you're uh, walking out of your laboratory. Someone may be waiting to shoot you or threaten the family. I never worried about it too much. I mean, I paid attention and there were some precautions that I would take. I was more concerned about the family than myself.
University of California, San Francisco. West Wing Ninth Floor is one of the most sophisticated biotechnology labs in America. Researchers here are exploring one of the hottest fields in recent years, gene therapy. They inject genes into the heart of mice to treat heart disease. Initial results are promising. In animal experiment, this treatment... Uh, yeah, Heading this research team is a scientist from Hong Kong, Ken Yutwai. Ken began his career as a hematologist. Four decades ago, in Montreal, a newborn baby with a leukemia brought about a change in his career and his life. At that time, very little was known about the disease, so I thought that perhaps, you know, it w I would like to you know, do research and investigate how this disease come, come, uh, come about. The Human Genome Project is now completed. The sequences of the 3 billion DNA in the human body is no longer a mystery. But to figure out what trait each DNA sequence is encoded to control is still a formidable task today, let alone 30 years ago. In 1975, Can discovered that thalassemia was caused by the absence of one particular gene, the first time a disease had been defined at the DNA level. The following year, he became the first person to diagnose a disease using DNA when he checked for thalassemia in a fetus by examining DNA extracted from amniotic fluid. I think it's really too... Uh... Judy Chang has collaborated with Ken for over 20 years. She worked under him on thalassemia research. He always show very enthusiastic about your work. You don't get bored uh, working in the lab. Maybe you should ask her when I'm not around, so <laughs> see what she really think. <laughs> yeah. well, very seldom that he's not around. <laughs> Is that right? yeah. Judy finds you Ken a motivating work? leader, but he's a man of few praises. Ken Yu Tui was born to a prominent family in Hong Kong. His father, Ken Tong Po, was one of the founders of the Bank of East Asia. His eldest brother, Ken Yu Tkeng, was a former senior ex-official member of the Executive Council. Ken Yu Tui is the only one of 14 siblings to study medicine. My father, he decided that his youngest son should go to medical school. In those days, of course, you know, you do, you do exactly what your father tells you to do. And you were very obedient. Yeah, we have to be, or we won't survive. Ken's greatest contribution to human genetics is his discovery of DNA polymorphism in 1978. At the time, Ken was studying sickle cell anemia. He found certain enzymes cut certain DNA sequences at particular spots. When the enzyme reads the DNA sequence CTGAGG, which is found in normal people, it cuts the DNA. But in sickle cell anemia patients, there's a mutation. The nucleotide A is replaced by a T. The enzyme doesn't cut the sequence and the DNA retains its length. Just by gauging the length of the sequence, Doctors can tell if a person has the disease without looking for the actual sickle cell anemia gene. This phenomenon is now known as DNA polymorphism. By looking for polymorphic variations in DNA sequences, researchers can detect hereditary diseases in patients. Now somebody would to use the analogy of finding something else to mark the region. We know that the 7-Eleven, the convenience store, is quite well uh, distributed in any city. If you want to find a, a certain house, if you can tell you that it's near a certain 7-Eleven, 
store, then you can actually go find the store and then you know that within one mile distance you will have this particular house. Over the years, Ken has received numerous awards for his groundbreaking work in genetics. In 1981, he became the first Chinese fellow of the Royal Society of London. In 91, he won America's most prestigious medical prize, the Albert Lasker Award. This year, he received the Shaw Prize in the Life Science and Medicine category. He is really the, the father of modern human genetics. Whereas Sui, I mean, I, I myself uh, really benefit from, from his uh, contribution. Uh, the way I found the gene for cystic fibrosis, really literally follow the concept, follow the, his original observation. Ken's scientific research is meticulous, leaving no room for error. But he can be loose in other matters. When his grandchild was born, his friends wanted to see a photo of the child. Napa Valley, California. Every weekend, Ken and his wife would stay here. There. There was no sun yesterday. Such weekend breaks, however, was rare when Ken was younger. His wife describes him as a workaholic, laboring deep into the night and merging private life with work. She says soon after their second daughter was born, Ken extracted blood from her for research. You can't get many women who are going to give blood that way, you know, or they put their child up for a blood sample at that young an age. And it was, um, it was uh, very difficult. She, they had to uh, try to get a vein in the head when she was about a month old. So what was your feeling? That's fine. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Anything for research, you know. <laughs> More yeah, but there's nothing, just drawing some blood from, from the baby, nothing. Not from the jugular, dear. Oh, whatever. no, they do that. That's one I know it. Do I know it. it, but it's awful. Anyway. So you think it, the research work is the most important thing in your life? No, no. My wife is more important. <laughs> <laughs> I'll prove it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow, so many candles. Yeah, oh, old, older than I am. Six, Six years, years old, seven years old. Uh, where's the fire extinguisher? Uh oh. It Happy birthday, dear Gong Ken Yutwai is now 68. After almost half a century as a scientist, he intends to continue with his research and hopefully come up with more breakthroughs. <laughs> What we were doing was trying to find out why there had been such a big increase in lung cancer. And so, with a good cup of tea, begins Sir Richard Dahl's story about a study that was to eventually change smoking habits around the world. As a young medical epidemiologist, Sir Richard worked here at London's University College Medical School. It was the mid-40s, and lung cancer across England was spreading fast. Doctors blamed it on car exhaust and road tarring. No one thought of cigarettes. It was very difficult to believe it was, of course, because it was such, everybody did it. It was such a common thing. You smoked? I smoked, yes, yes, I did. I gave up halfway through the study when the results began to become so clear. <laughs> results after questioning 700 patients diagnosed with lung cancer in hospital and some important follow-up detective work. One of my jobs was to go round afterwards 
and look at the discharge notes of each patient and see what disease they actually had had. And what I found was that if the person had been recorded as a non-smoker, the diagnosis of lung cancer was never right. It turned out to be something else. Whereas if it was a heavy smoker, it was nearly, it was very frequently right, nearly always right. Sir Richard and his colleagues published a paper of their findings linking smoking with lung cancer, but response was underwhelming. It couldn't have had less attention paid. <laughs> Very few people took it seriously. And even the Cancer Advisory Committee to the Department of Health advised the department not to do anything about it because it said it isn't really proved. It may frighten people. You shouldn't do anything about it. The results weren't believed, and neither was the way the information had been gathered. Sir Richard's methods, cohort and case control studies, standard now, were a revolution in medical research at the time. You were really doing the uphill battle, weren't you? Yes, yes. It was to get this, this technique established as a me recognized as a way of proving a cause of disease, a cause of disease. So this is... Yes. This is the route to the office every morning. That's right, yes. That's quite good, isn't it? It's like a five-minute walk. It's very nice indeed, yes. Mm. I've always been privileged living in Oxford ever since I've been here. I've lived in three different houses for that four now. And I've always been within walking distance. Sir Richard and his colleagues set out on another study right away, this time questioning two-thirds of Britain's physicians, 40,000 male doctors surveying their smoking habits, and those who went on to develop lung cancer. Three years later, they had a direct link. That was 1954, but they still had a long wait before the British government, media, public, and then the world woke up and noticed. It wasn't until 1957, that's seven years after, the first, after our first report, the government formally asked the Medical Research Council for its opinion on what our findings meant. Well, here's the beginning of a new article, MC. If you wouldn't mind having a go to the first draft of it. And in 1957, the Medical Research Council said they mean that cigarette smoking is responsible for the great majority of lung cancers. Sir Richard Dahl arrived here at Oxford in 1969 into the highly regarded position of Regis, Professor of Medicine. Warden here at Green College, he directed his own medical research unit while publishing breakthrough studies on subjects ranging from asbestos to peptic ulcers and the pill. But it was his groundbreaking work on smoking and cancer that continues to impact the minds and the lives of millions around the world. Richard Dahl told us how to avoid death in middle age. 30 years ago in Britain, half of all the deaths in middle age were caused by smoking. Since then, most of the smokers in Britain have given up, and we've got the best decrease in tobacco deaths in the world. Richard Dole's work has avoided millions of deaths. In 1954, the year Sir Richard's second study was published, 80% of British adults smoked. Today, it's just a third that, 26%. Richard Pedos worked alongside Sir Richard for 35 years. Together, the two enjoyed a glorious moment this past summer with the publication of the longest and the largest work on smoking ever. A landmark 50-year study following the original group, some 40,000 male doctors, surveyed back in the early 50s to now, with some rather surprising results. Number one, long-term smokers die an average 10 years earlier than non-smokers. Number two, giving up works really well. Stop at 60, add an extra three years to your life. Kick the habit at 50, and you get six more years of life. And before that, well, you're just about turning back the clock completely. If you stop at 30, even if you stop at 40, you avoid 
most of the risk of getting killed by it. It's extraordinary the way the body can make good the damage. Stopping just works ridiculously well. That was really, that, those are the two main conclusions. The risks are bigger than people thought and stopping works better than people thought. Anybody who's interested in history and is, um, will be interested in Richard's life. And really for the last 50 years, Richard Dahl has been the world's leading epidemiologist. And his contribution to um, public health medicine, just to make people healthier, to understand how to avoid cancer, the big fear of the 20th century, for that alone, one would like to see what were the things that drove Richard on to work so hard and to be so dedicated to such a great humanitarian task. Conrad Keating, former BBC journalist, is writing a book about Sir Richard's life. From his birth in 1912 to his years fighting in World War II and his dedication to socialized medicine in England, Sir Richard's asked Conrad to wait to publish the book until after he's passed away giving the author full freedom. Hello. Sir Richard, knighted for his contribution to medicine in 1971, spent 30 years in the Communist Party. He met the love of his life, Joan, and survived her death three years ago. But marrying her to begin with was a determined battle. Joan was married to Hugh Faulkner, uh, another iconic figure in left-wing London medicine, and they had a son. And I think it was very difficult. It caused a massive split in uh, London left-wing medicine. And it was true, I know, Richard used to get phone calls from King Street, sorry, from the uh, headquarters of the Communist Party of Great Britain, telling him to break off the love affair with Joan Doll, that this was wrecking everything that communist doctors were trying to do. So he had to fight for her love, and I would say it was perhaps the most rewarding fight of his career. It's when I got an honorary degree at Harvard and I was on the platform and my wife was in the audience and after I was presented with the honorary degree, I turned around and I blew her a kiss and I had no idea the photographer was <laughs> focused on me at the time and he just caught me blowing a kiss to my wife, which I thought was rather nice. Yeah, beautiful. So, I'm rather fond of that picture. Always a fighter for his beliefs, Sir Richard's work has been recognized worldwide. He's received honorary degrees from 15 universities, co-written a book on cancer, and over 400 papers spanning a wide array of issues. He's uncovered evidence showing alcohol can increase the risk of breast cancer in women, and people with gastric ulcers shouldn't be limited to a bland diet. He's testified in court battles with big tobacco, spent weeks on the witness stand arguing the merits of fluoride in water. He's still working today, investigating the effects of radon in houses, which he says are more dangerous if you smoke. And he's won several awards, but he's modest about that. How many awards have you won? About 20. In fact, it's about 32. But none are on display. They're humbly hidden from view. American College of Physicians. American Cancer Society. And one or two are gold medals. I tell if I don't keep them here, I keep them locked up. I can't show you. Royal Society of Medicine. I've just been so lucky in life. And it was another sort of luck that landed Sir Richard in medicine to begin with. His intention was to study maths. He went to Cambridge to test for it. It was a four-day exam, and on the night of the third, the third day, some, quote, friends, unquote, who'd gone up the year before, took me out to dinner in Trinity College, where they gave me three pints of Audi's ale, which is 8% alcohol. Well, the next day, my paper was not very good. <laughs> and so he wasn't offered the full scholarship he was expecting. And I was so cross. I said, Father, I won't go to Cambridge and read mathematics. I'll do medicine as you wanted me to do instead. And I'll go to London to study medicine. And that was how I came to study medicine. <laughs>
can thank a hangover. <laughs> That's right. Best three pints of beer I ever drank in my life. <laughs> Well, let's have a toast. Yeah. Shall we? Okay. Yes. To uh, your winning the Shaw Award. Thank you indeed. Congratulations. Something indeed. The Shaw is Sir Richard's 33rd award. And with the Shaw Award comes one million American in prize money. Sir Richard will give a portion of that to each of his two children and donate a good chunk to his beloved Green College Observatory for building renovations. It's here. This is the new doll building. Yes, the whole of this building. By next summer, the doll building will house Oxford University's new epidemiological research and clinical trials unit. But it's miles from Sir Richard's home, so that's when, he says, he'll finally retire. Did you ever think you'd have a building in a hospital named after you? <laughs> no, I never did. <laughs> Underscoring again the good doctor's contribution to public health and a life in service. And what do you think you've given the world? I haven't given the world anything like as much as the world's given me. I hope I've given the world the idea that life is worth living. Stanley Cohen is the other scientist in the discovery. Also aged 69, Cohen remains a genetics and medicine professor at Stanford University. In his eponymous laboratory, more than 10 researchers conduct the most advanced biotechnology research. What underlies the success of science is the ideas, the ideas for creative experiments that address important and meaningful scientific questions. Cohen and Boyer met in 1972 when they both attended a scientific conference in Hawaii. There, the academics explained their research projects. Boyer was studying the state of DNA after being cut by certain enzymes. He found the open ends from the cuts can link up with other similar genetic fragments. Cohen was specializing in research into plasmids, the DNA in bacteria that's shaped like a small ring and has the ability to self-replicate. Well, I suggested to Herb that we collaborate and I told him what I had in mind. And he said, well, you know, he was thinking of similar types of experiments. So uh, it was a perfect match. He didn't have the enzymes to do it. And I didn't have his little plasmid. Uh, and um, so we had, it was a perfect marriage. Cohen and Boyer linked the DNA of a frog with a plasmid and put it back inside bacteria. They found when bacterial cells multiplied, the new DNA also self-replicated. This breakthrough is called cloning. It enabled the mass production of medicines such as insulin and growth hormones. The other application is to be able to think about gene therapy. The same thing by taking a piece of DNA from one organism and put it to another animal so that we have the so-called biotechnology, genetic engineering, uh, so we can uh, improve the quality of uh, crops, improve the quality of stocks and, and all that. It's all uh, as a result of uh, this uh, ability to manipulate to clone DNA. Genetic engineering benefits mankind with innovations in healing diseases and making drugs. But it also raised the controversial possibility of cloning animals or even humans. You can count on me. You are so considerable. Next come the Hui Uge Yi and Miao ethnic. Tianjin's Nankai University. Amidst the bustling campus and towering buildings stands a small house. Inside lives an old mathematician. The university built the house for him, complete with an elevator and six attendants to care for his daily needs. In a month, he'll turn 93. <laughs> In 
In the early 1940s, Chen Shengshen was already established as a leader in differential geometry and topology in the United States. Uh, once alive, there are all kinds of accidents. Of course, uh, one thing is not luck, but mathematics. You need a mathematical foundation, which I had, and other people didn't. Four years ago, he left the U.S. to return to its roots, Nanka University. Nanka was a school. It's very natural. A person's most beautiful time Nowadays, Chen rarely leaves home. When he does, it's almost always for mathematics. Chen is known as the rock of modern geometry. A recipient of the prestigious mathematical award, the Wolf Prize, Chen founded the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in the United States, as well as the Nankai Institute of Mathematics in China. On this day, he hosted an international conference at Nankai. The case of a linear differential system of homogeneous space, if you only have the differential, differential structure, Today's lecture is on Finsler geometry, a lesser-known field Chern has been promoting in recent years. Chern Shengshen was born in October 1911 in the midst of the Nationalist Revolution. When Chen was 11, he followed his father to Tianjin and attended secondary school there. Back then, he wrote an essay which remains on display at the school. In it, he used 16 different ways to prove the same geometric theorem. But Chen never imagined then that he'd become a great mathematician. I didn't know what, what my future was. Probably the usual ordinary thinking is that a mathematics student will end his career as a high school teacher. I didn't mind. At the age of 15, Chen entered Nankai University. At first, he chose to study science. But while doing experiments, he poured cold water into a hot test tube, which shattered. Chen realized his talents lay with maths after all. Later, he was awarded a government scholarship to study in Hamburg, Germany, the hub of mathematics at the time. In just a year, he got his doctorate degree and went on to Paris to study with the eminent geometer Elie Catin, embarking on his long journey in differential geometry. After two years in Europe, Chen returned in 1937 to a China embroiled in the Sino-Japanese War. That did not distract Chen from his academic work, which won him respect abroad. He was invited to work in the United States. The Second World War had begun, and he had to fly to Calcutta to wait to board a military plane. The city was completely dark. There's no airport. So we started at a waiting room, then somebody came in. It turned out he was the pilot of our plane. Uh, he took a big flashlight and came in and so lighted the room and asked, uh, are you going with me? <laughs> well, I said, yes. So he said, follow me. He just, I just followed him with my suitcase, a small suitcase of mine. Arriving at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, Chern found himself in the company of many prominent European scientists fleeing the Second World War, as well as Albert Einstein. It was here that Chern completed his most influential research. His theory, set out on merely three sheets of paper, is a definitive breakthrough in differential geometry. Every day, we come across geometrical diagrams and lines. Simple geometry is straightforward. Secondary school students learn it. 
When it comes to describing the path of objects moving on a curve, you need differential geometry. To understand genetic structures, map human movements, or design a robotic arm, differential geometry comes into play. Chern's breakthrough is in applying differential geometry to understanding the structure of space. His concept, known as Chern class, is now a useful tool to scientists of different disciplines. Chern classes is uh, fundamental to understand the structure of many different spaces, especially in algebraic geometry. So after 60 to 70 years of development, it is uh, almost uh, unthinkable uh, not to have train classes in modern geometry and modern uh, physics or modern uh, topology. But Chern hopes everyone, not just academics, can share his love for maths. To promote maths is fun, Chern has designed a hanging calendar and paid to have it printed. He hopes to show the world the interesting side of mathematics. His lifelong ambition is to advance the development of mathematics in China. When World War II ended, Chern left the U.S. and returned to China, where he set up a mathematics institute at the Nanjing Nationalist Government Central Research Academy. But when civil war erupted, the head of the research institute at Princeton sent him a telegram. I remember clearly his telegram says, if there's anything we can do to make you come into this country, please let us know. In late 1948, Chern made a momentous decision. He and his family left for the U.S. and stayed there for more than five decades. In recent years, Chern's legs have become weak. He now works mostly from his bedroom at his quarters in Nankai University. In the younger days of his, and he got up very early, like 3 o'clock or something. And he already spent maybe three, four, five hours working on mathematics before ordinary people would get up. He's always thinking about mathematics. We can tell usually while we are having conversation with him. And he's very nice and talking about different problems. But in between, sometimes he was staring at the ceilings, and you know he was thinking about mathematics. Paul Chu is Chern's son-in-law. He's now an expert in superconductors. Chu recalls when he first embarked on that unpopular field, Chern had given him much encouragement. Over decades, Chern has taught numerous students. Some have made a name for themselves, including Yao Xing Tong. <laughs> Yao was an undergraduate at Chinese University when he met Chen. Chen was impressed and arranged for Yao to enter UC Berkeley for graduate studies. You know, Hong Kong universities are so stupid, stupid with the capital S. They didn't give Xu Zhentong a degree because he, he lacked some credits in social sciences. But I recommend him to the University of California at Berkeley. I said, we must have this student. So Berkeley just uh, disregarded the fact that he did not have a bachelor's degree. So I wrote to Li Zhuming, the president of Chinese University at that time. I, I told him that you are really stupid. 
the good student, you, you don't give him a degree. Also, sometimes you have to give him an honor doctor's degree. Uh, he, later, he, they did this. Although he's confined to a wheelchair, Chern's health is good, his mind clear. This is another wheelchair. Now, he simply wants to devote his time to mathematics.